Hi, everybody. Uh, Hi. As Mark said, my name is Aubrey Hedrick, and I'm an intelligence analyst with the Northeast Ohio Regional Fusion Center, or the Norfolk, and we're located in Cleveland. The mission of the Norfolk uh, is to facilitate and enhance the level of interagency communications, criminal and intelligence analysis, and information sharing among federal, state, and local agencies and the private sector in order to anticipate and counter criminal activity, terrorism, and other hazards in coordination with law enforcement and the intelligence community. There are two other fusion centers in Ohio. Uh, they're located in Columbus and Cincinnati, and our area of responsibility includes the five counties of Ashtabula, Cuyahoga, Lake Lorraine, and Geauga. Uh, the Norfolk provides support in many different ways, including through our access to multiple law enforcement databases, as well as by performing open source and public face social media research. We also have access to the other 79 fusion centers throughout the United States who we can both request information from and send information to. So there are lots of ways that we can help. Um, if you have any questions or need any assistance, you can contact us at 216-515-8477. Or our email address is info at n-e-o-r-f-c dot u-s. And thank you so much. Thank you, Aubrey. Okay, with that, I'm going to give a little bit of background on uh, on Dr. Arazi's biography, and, and then we'll get started. So um, thank you again, Doctor, for being with us today and for everybody's awareness. Uh, Dr. Terry Arazi is an associate professor and vice chair of the Pharmaco Pharmacology and Toxicology Department in the Boonshoff School of Medicine, uh, Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio. Her subject matter expertise is Homeland Security. As part of her role at the Boonshoff School of Medicine, she serves as uh, director of the graduate and the chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear uh, defense programs. She started her career in the Army and uh, transitioned to the laboratory uh, doing molecular genomics uh, work and merged her military and science experiences to develop the Homeland Security focus for the school, the medical school and the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology. Uh, her research basically identifies the attributes of the, an American terrorist by studying the patterns within 50 demographic variables and exploring their correlation with the motivation to commit crimes related to terrorism. Uh, this understanding helps to halt the recruitment of American citizens by providing a profile that will quickly identify a person identify a person that is susceptible to radicalization and offer tools to intervene. Uh, not only uh, does her research confirm the previous findings, but it has expanded on, uh, upon the, them by examining 519 U.S. citizens convicted of crimes related to terrorism since September 11, uh, 2001. By creating a well-sourced and researched list of behaviors, methods for, by, I'm sorry, by creating a well-sourced and re researched list of behaviors, methods for community-based curbing of radicalization can be provided. With that, thank you very much again, uh, Dr. Arazi, for being uh, uh, part of our discussion today, and I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you. Um, thank you. You know, you shared so much now, I feel like I don't even have to go through the first few slides to introduce myself. So, you know, you'll save me time for the really important information. Um, welcome, thank you for coming in and hearing my talk. Um, like Mr. Christie said, I got my start in the military, in the Army, doing um, nuke biochem NBC work and transitioned, uh, ended up getting a couple degrees in science, um, molecular genetics and, and uh, evolutionary biology. My doctorate work was in crisis decision-making, which is very fitting for your next talk. So maybe I can get invited to uh, attend that next talk that you're going to be having on crisis communication. I started the Dayton Think Tank with our mayor, Nan Whaley. Um, in 2016, and I am newly appointed Secretary of InfraGuard National Members Alliance. I imagine because we are talking about the Cleveland area, many of you are InfraGuard members, and if not, you should be. Um, and then um, obviously my main role, the one that, that pays the bills is as a professor and vice chair in the medical school. Uh, switching to the next, there we go. Okay, so, so like you mentioned, um, I, I've been doing this work since, for quite a while, since 2014, and that number keeps expanding. So while uh, when I gave this to you, the bio, there was 519, but I have been working 
um, diligently to give you guys the best and, um, and the most up to date. So thanks to the previous work ended in 2018, at the end of 2018 with the 519. We are now in 2021 up to 635. So you may think with, with all the extremist activity going on um, with COVID that none of the, that there has not been any terrorist acts uh, or, or thwarted terrorist acts, but in fact, we've had several. So again, my number is now 635. And if you ask, you know, why did I, was I interested in this work? I did, um, I originally back in um, several years ago, wrote a book, uh, co-edited a book with the chief psychologist from, from Guantanamo Bay, um, Dr. Larry James, and he was the psychologist. I was the WMD expert. And, um, and so we, we edited this book. It was a three book deal. The second book was on terrorism. That's really what got me motivated to start looking at behind the scenes, who are the ones using the chem bioradnic defense um, or um, weapons. I am a professor, which means I have to have learning objectives, improve communication. Uh, you know, so many times when we hear news, hear the media, they talk about, you know, they give you a number, they give you some stats, but they don't give you the behind the, uh, behind the scenes, the real data, the real statistics. And I'm gonna give you that today. And I'm not gonna tell you how many slides because that's gonna scare you away and I'm gonna see you guys dropping off, but just bear with me. Um, because I, uh, again, because I'm a professor, I know you're not going to absorb all this. There's not going to be a quiz or a test at the end, and you will have the PDF so you can go back to it. So what I hope today is just to inform you, to give you an understanding, and then at your leisure, you can go back and examine the charts and the, and the data in, in more detail. So another thing is to recognize and appropriately respond to potential threats. That goes along with the profile that is, you know, something we're going to talk about quickly. And then um, summarize and apply the fundamentals of terrorism to other violent behaviors, because we know terrorism is not the only thing out there. And then again, crisis decision-making, um, use this information to, to help you um, make better decisions. It's always important to start out with, uh, with the definition of terrorism so that we're all speaking from the same page. Unfortunately, there is no single definition. So what I have here for you is uh, three different definitions from the Department of Justice, uh, USC Code 18 and DOD. And, and I've merged that into one definition, the unlawful use or of force and violence against persons or property intended to intimidate or coerce a civilian population often motivated by religious, political or other ideological beliefs. And with that, we're gonna get started. The first thing is, and what I get asked often is, what makes a, a crime an act of terror? And it's simply, it has to follow that definition. And, and the reasons will, will become more apparent as I go through the next few slides. So it's not the type of crime, it's not the scale, it is that definition that makes that difference. And the, the way the courts handle it um, is, is a major uh, determining factor. What you see in front of you is uh, this image in front of you happened one mile from my home in the Oregon district in 2019. It's when Connor Bates uh, killed uh, nine people, injured 27, before the police then shot and killed him. Um, one of those nine dead was one of my son's friends. Uh, he was celebrating a birthday party. My son was invited but could not go, thankfully. And uh, hit this friend and two others in the party, were two were injured and then the friend was, was killed. This is the first time in 2019, where sharing this information and, and really um, this hit home. And now I think I, I share it with more gusto. And, um, and, you know, it really, it's really become a passion project for me. Again, again I want to not necessarily make you subject matter experts, but I want to give you a little bit about everything so that you can walk away with some, um, with, with more knowledge than you had before this hour started. So one of the things is discussing the, um, the terrorist um, with, the, with the laws and the levels and everything. So right now I'm gonna start with telling you about material support. Material support is the most common sentence for an uh, American terrorist. And so if you are um, convicted of an act related to terrorism like material support, 
you will get, a, it used to be a maximum of 15, now it's a maximum of 20, and you will be considered level 26, and the category would depend on, on um, your previous criminal history, but just looking here, material support, that means you, you want to hop on a plane and you want to go overseas and train, you're going to get five years, four months minimum. Now that does increase by two levels uh, if you have any weapons um, or involved any weapons or funds to, um, to add to that. Now, this is only if this is the only crime you've done. Otherwise, that category, it goes from one to six, that category increases your sentence. And now there's something called terrorism enhancement charge. While material support directly relates to terrorism, most most of them do not. Most offenses do not like, um, well, murder, um, you know, burglary. There's a few financial um, convictions that you can get. And, and if you're doing this because you want to support one of those designated uh, federal uh, terrorist organizations, international terrorist organizations, you, and you get this terrorism enhancement charge, it doesn't matter if your felony is a level one or your felony is a level 15 or your felony is a level 30 you will automatically get pushed up to a 32. Now you can see on the screen what that means and how the ranges go um, far um, high up the ranges go. And it also will put you at a category six. So you will get a 17 and a half year minimum sentence. And like I said, this felony can be something minor or it can be something major. Now, if your felony is over 32, you will automatically get shot up 12 more levels. So you just may consider yourself life in prison. So this, this actually, there's a lot of debate on whether or not this is fair because of that, that difference of what that felony looks like prior to getting this enhancement charge. So another thing is intent. And you have to prove intent if, for example, so say the, the 50, uh, 49 and I are, are in a room and we're planning, okay, 49 is a little over the top, but let's just say we're all in a room and we're planning on robbing a bank, and we have blueprints all around and the FBI shows up. They cannot do anything about it because they cannot prove that we're planning on doing this crime. They have to wait until we actually do it. Well, if we are known to belong to, you know, Hezbollah or one of the other terrorist organizations and they catch us with these blueprints, they can act. So that's a really big difference between a non-terrorist um, charge versus a terrorist charges. They just have to to appear to be intended to, um, to have that charge put up against us. Okay, um, we can do a show of hands, right? Um, so we're gonna play a, a game. We, we actually have a couple games, this is the first one. And you know, there's a few takeaways. And I just wanna warn you in advance that I have done this um, with, with some members of Congress. I've done this at NSA, Quantico, and they rarely get the right answer. So just be warned. What I have here are two individuals and I want you to tell me which one is the domestic uh, terrorist versus international. So the first one is A, that's Boris. Boris is not a United States citizen. However, he has managed to get inside our borders to commit a terrorist act in our country. The other fella is Fred. You can tell Fred's a United States uh, a citizen because he's got the flag on and you know we like to do that kind of thing. And he hates our country so much, his own country so much that he's gone overseas and is plotting to do a terrorist act on the United States, on US, uh, on Americans. So I need a show of hands. Is Boris a domestic terrorist? Can we see hands? Mark, are we able to see hands? Yes, if you uh, look see. at the panelists uh, or okay. participant. Uh, I'm afraid to touch that, yeah, so you'll have to... Okay, we're, we're going to just, we're going to let Mark um, uh, check that out. But the next question, of course, is B, is Fred a, a domestic terrorist? And so um, now you guys are on record for having your choice. And I'll check that out later when I'm done speaking to see how many of you got it right. So, But the correct answer is A. If an individual plans or trains for a terror act in the United States, he is a domestic terrorist. If he or she plans or trains outside the United States, they are an international terrorist. If they plan and train in both locations, then it's up to the courts to decide. 
All right, so here's the game I talked to you about earlier. Um, I wanna make sure before I share all my data with you guys that you are not a potential terrorist. So we're gonna play a game and it's quick. For some of you, it's quicker than, other, for, than others. So I need all of you, even though I cannot see you, I want all of you to stand up right now. And we're gonna go through this eight marker profile. And now you see in front of you that I have a lot of stats. I just want you to pay attention to that bar, but I made a point to tell you that I don't want you to just take my word for it. I wanna show you the stats to back everything up. So you're gonna see a lot of information around you, but I want you to, to relax because I will share and speak more about those different charts and tables um, down the road. But right now, if you were a female, you can sit down. So the game's over for you, but I don't want you to feel left out. So I'll still share stats about females. Um, and, and the reason is there's um, fewer, there's 8% of the American terrorists have been female. Now don't, don't think that means that they're not dangerous. In fact, some of the researchers say they're more brutal than their male counterparts. You know, and they can also go in under the radar, um, be more uh, not easily identifiable. So, so you know, we're not we're not innocent. The next one is, if you are between the ages of twenty and fifty years old, you're more likely to have terrorist aspirations. So keep standing. The rest of you sit down. Now I don't know the average the age of the people attending or watching this. I'm going to assume you're probably closer to the higher end, and I don't want you to feel left out. So instead of setting down because you're outside of the actual 50 years old or under 20, I want you to use your mental age. And you know, most of you men, you're probably you're mentally a few years younger than maybe the 50. So uh, I want you to keep standing so you can still continue to be part of this game. The third one is educated. If you have a college education, keep standing. And now this chance even increases even more if you're unemployed. And let me just share how, why. If you're working at Walmart or you're working at, at McDonald's and you know, you're just satisfied, you're not making the money you want. If you do not have a college education, you take some of that ownership. You're like, you know, I should have gone to college like my friends, earned lots of money. Um, contrary to what they believe, not all educated college educated people make a lot of money. But, you know, that's besides the point. So they, they own it. They know they've done something. However, if they have a college education and they put in the time and they put in the money and they have the student loans and they're still working at McDonald's or, you know, Walmart or wherever, they're going to blame it on somebody else because they did, the, they did what they needed to do and they can't get the job they want. So that's why increased chances with unemployment. If you are married or have a girlfriend, sit down. That's because, guys, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you're going to go off and do something stupid with your buddies, what are the chances that your wife or girlfriend is going to let that happen? They're more likely to make you sit your butt down and you're not going anywhere. So I say that and, and I fully support that. The real reason is because this shows that you have a connection that you have you're responsible for other people. Uh, and so you're less likely to go off and do something stupid because you have those commitments with others. But I still like to believe it's because we're not gonna let you. Number five, uh, if you are raised by a mother or grandfather, no father figure, keep standing. And uh, like gangs, terrorist leadership likes to, uh, to bring people in, wine and dine them, and then have them do something egregious. And they and the people will feel compelled to do that because they've been taken care of. Number six, if you come from a poor family, sit down. Now, as you can, I'm going to talk more about the stats. The stats don't directly align with this statement um, on the surface, but I'll talk more about that later. Um, but for this, you, as you can see, uh, the poor are too busy surviving to get caught up with terrorism. And usually the upper uh, middle class, upper class, they want to be like heroes for their people so they get involved. If you live in a country or location different from your place of origin, keep standing. Now, while I am showing you other countries, I want to point out that this doesn't have to be another country. This can mean you are 
from California and you move to Ohio, or you're from the city and you move to the country or vice versa. It's just a sense where you feel like you don't belong. And so you're going to reach out to other things. Now, when I give this talk, in the past when I've given this talk, I use the example of the game cornhole. Now, I don't know if up north in Ohio, you guys play cornhole, but in, in our area, cornhole is a common game. Now, I gave this talk and I had a couple of people come up and say, don't use that example anymore because cornhole apparently is something related to sex. And I thought, well, that's even more of a reason why I should share this because for us, if we're talking about cornhole, we're talking about something entirely different. And it's a great example how different locations have have different common language, common games and common things and can make other people feel left out. Lastly, if you feel isolated or angry or victimized, keep standing, everybody else sit down. Okay, we have 52 participants. How many of you are still standing? So um, if you're still standing, please just in the chat window, put your name and maybe your address because on Sunday I'm heading up to Quantico and, um, and over to headquarters and have and I'll be having sit downs with some important people and I just may share your name. So uh, keep that in mind, put it in there. And then if you get a phone call next week, you'll know why. So, you know, terrorism is, is one of those things that it's a global problem. Um, and how can we bring it down to our community? And I think that's where people struggle. And I just want to point out that we have other global problems that we've been able to bring down to our community. And I list them here, poverty, pollution, and world peace. So what do we do at a community level to fight poverty? We have soup kitchens. What do we do uh, for pollution? We have recycle centers. And then lastly, what do we do for world peace? We have beauty pageants. And then if that doesn't work, we also have places of worship and community centers. So with that in mind, it just tells you that we can take uh, something global, a global problem like terrorism and bring it down to our neighborhood. What I have in front of you are seven of the eight, um, of the eight profiles. The one not here is gender. And I know recently gender, it's become more fluid, but to date, we haven't had any terrorists identify as something other than male and female. So I'm gonna stay with that until, it, until uh, we end up with others that, that um, recognize differently. So with that, we have these seven. And I just wanna point out some things that you can do uh, if you notice a colleague, a, a student, a, a friend or family member is maybe uh, going down that path. Maybe they meet five or six or seven or all eight of those profiles markers, what can you do to steer them down a better path, encourage them to be to join productive groups, help them, you know, get gainful employment, be a friend, you know, change their narrative to something positive, call out bad behaviors, you know, make them feel acclimated, be a big brother, big sister. And lastly, if you do see something, say something. Okay, so I'm going to assume that you're that everyone paying attention, everyone here is uh, is good and we're gonna move on. And I'm just gonna go through quickly uh, the names of the terrorists. And again, these are all American citizens, birth and naturalized that have been charged with terrorism since 9-11. And what many times they do change their name. And so what I have is I have their birth name and then I have their, uh, their second name or other um, names that they use, other spellings of their names in parentheses. And so I'm not gonna go through all of them because that would take a long time. We only have an hour, but again, I wanna remind you that you are able to go back to this presentation and review it at your leisure. I mentioned up to 50 different demographics and that changes depending on if you were in the military or not. So not all 50 were, ident were measured with those same variables. In some cases, it's really difficult to find the information. For example, uh, to find out if somebody goes to college you're not going to find that in the court records. You're likely not going to find it in any national releases. You have to go to a local newspaper to find out that kind of information. So to find that information on all 635 is impossible. So you will notice as we go through these different um, categories that that sample size changes based off of how much I was able to retrieve. 
Um, and you know, it's never ending. This could go on forever. There was a case where there was a father who said his two sons could not be terrorists because they've been in, involved in failed marriages and ended up that um, one was in high school, one was uh, doing a, a doctoral program. And I thought, well, what are the chances the high school guy's married? Well, it ends up he had been married. The other guy, his brother had been the one in a doctoral program, had been married twice and they were both going through a divorce. That took me quite a few hours to actually find that information. And that is for six, all 635. So, uh, so you will see that at some point you just have to stop and move forward when, when collecting data. So we're going to start out with demographics. And you did see a few of these um, in, the pro, in the game, but we're going to give you a little bit more detail. Uh, males, 582, 92%. Female, 8%. Terrorist ages, the, the chart on the right shows all the terrorist ages, but I broke it down on the bottom by females, 20 years, the average age, 22 average age for the males. This is an example of where they lived prior to um, their terrorist act. And some of them you know, were local, some of them went overseas. But you know, one thing to notice is, and this was actually brought to me at another talk uh, for extremists, they tend to border, um, have water boundaries. Now it also can be um, you know, bigger size population, but you know, look at, at Ohio, we're number 38. And there's some other states quite, you know, with a higher population. This is the chart. This is the same thing in chart form. And as you can see, Ohio is number seven. In 2018, when this was calculated, Ohio was number five. So that's some good news. Uh, Florida was actually number six. And as you can see, Florida is up to number three now. So in the past two, three years, Florida has had some serious terrorism action. These are the top 10 cities where they resided prior to arrest. And there we are, Columbus and Cleveland. This is the locations of the terrorists, um, either the terrorists themselves or their parents. The first one is, is just a, a map view of where they come from. The second one across are, are birth locations for all the parents, um, naturalized and birth. And you can see. Uh, in my case, you know, I, as a professor in a university and a medical school, I have a lot of students that come here, a lot of international students, and they have children while they're here studying. And those children are American citizens. And so that's why we end up not, I mean, that's just an example of, of how you can end up being an American birth, but then have parents that are not Americans. And so the top one's birth. Then the bottom ones are U.S. born on, on the left and uh, naturalized on the right. Now you see how I have USA 298 in parentheses. That's because when I add that to the chart, that number just makes all the rest of them almost invisible. So I've taken it off the chart so you could actually get a better visual um, view. And these are only uh, terrorists uh, where there's been two or more because otherwise the numbers would be so long you wouldn't be able to see them on the screen. So I know some of you, uh, we have different learning styles and some of you are more visual where the map is maybe better than the charts and and so i'm trying to to get all of you involved and also show off this really cool uh cute video uh to show you where the terrorists reside ethnicity was one thing that i did not originally seek out to find but in in conversations after giving talks i've had people come back and ask me to find this information so what i have on the top are the ethnicities of the american citizens charged with acts related to terrorism all of them and then i broke it down into males and females as you can see in both cases uh, caucasian uh, is the top ethnicity with the second one being african american now, terror relationships differ quite a bit from males and females. The majority of males are divorced, or excuse me, are single. The majority of females are, well, also single, but there's a higher number married when it comes to percentage. But the females are really interesting. If you look at the bottom one, 12 of them married a terrorist, eight of them terrorized together, six of them had husbands that did not know they were engaged in terrorist activities, Two of them were engaged to a terrorist. 
and two of them divorced a terrorist. Now moving on, and I, I hope I'm not going too fast. There's a lot of information. And again, if you're not getting it all, you can go back, download the PDF. And then if you have any questions, just send me an email. This is like one of my favorite topics to talk about. We could go on for hours. Um, this is one that I think shocks a lot of people. And that is that only 12% have been um, diagnosed with a mental illness. Now, I'm sure there's quite a few that have not been diagnosed, but I'd like to think this is pretty accurate because if I was a terrorist and I had a mental illness or could claim a mental illness and I'm in front of a judge, you bet I'm going to say I'm mentally ill because I would rather go someplace and have that mental illness looked at rather than going to jail. Uh, you also see on the right uh, some of the most common, um, so, so common uh, mental illnesses. Now we're going to go on to allegiance. And I, I, I think this is well known, but if not, I want to share that US governments does, do not formally designate domestic terror organizations. Claiming to, that you belong to KKK or the Proud Boys or any of these organizations um, is not illegal unless they become a national, uh, international defined organization, which KKK is on its way. Um, the First Amendment protects the rights of people to associate with each other even if all they're doing is spewing hate and violence. So these are the domestic terrorist organizations that are currently active. And you see on the left, the organization by name and then on the right ideology. And these are the ones that have been identified. This is how they self-identify. So there may be others within it that are anti-government, but these are the, that's how they define themselves as anti-government. I broke them down into political ideology and religion, and sometimes they're both. And, uh, and again, this, this is something that they are not always, um, this is not often acknowledged when they're arrested. They don't get arrested and say, oh, by the way, I belong to this group. So this is just giving you a sample. The rest of them are probably being charged for things not related to domestic terrorism and, and often jail somewhere. Uh, for whatever crimes are committed. So this is, while the numbers are not high, this is just giving you an idea of where they are with the numbers that are, are known. So this is related to the Capitol, uh, the January 6th riot. This is not from my own data, but this is important to know. I really wanted to see how they look. I, they, many of them have been charged and I could not incorporate them into my uh, full body of work because I was afraid this event, this one event would skew all the data. So I kept them separate, but I did want you to see how it, how it pans out. And you can see some similarities. So, you know, the more males and females, age range, very similar. The ethnicity, uh, white Caucasian, also very similar to the main group, the main body of, of terrorists. And then over here, I have the veteran status. And unfortunately, quite a few veterans involved in the January 6th uh, riot. These are some of the organizations, the domestic terror organizations that were uh, part of the, uh, the riot. And this is Black Lives Matter. So, you know, um, many of the people involved in Black Lives Matter were charged with various crimes and 367 of those crimes were considered federal crimes. And I had the data from all 14, uh, 1,425 cases. And so that's what I'm sharing here. Um, this is again, not my data. So this is, this is not work that I personally re researched like with the January 6th, but I still wanted to give you some of the stats related. Uh, you can see the age range, it's very similar, 21 to 29. Again, Caucasians, the top one. And we do have male and female, and then here's where we're getting some of the um, non-binary gender, uh, 11 people involved, um, identified like that. So there is a lot of similarities with the rest of the terrorists. So um, inf these infographics I made, and you can see them behind me. And I have, I have, a PowerPoint that I have submitted that you guys will have access to. So you can make your own. 
Um, you print them out if you want, front, back. I've, I've put them in a way that you can do front, back, and you know which ones uh, in the PowerPoint. Um, put it on cardstock and share it with people. They're pretty popular. I have people stopping by my office sometimes just to grab, uh, grab those infographics. So here's the one on the military. We haven't yet covered that, so don't, don't look too closely. And then we have um, some you know, numeric hate symbology, um, acronyms. I live downtown in Dayton. I live like in the sec on the corner of Second and Main Street, and I end up seeing this kind of graffiti all over downtown when I'm I'm out walking the dog. Uh, here are some hand signs, and you see the front and then the back. Uh, on the right is the back side of that infographic. Here we have logos, and they're alphabetical. And then we have those those pages. And that was it. So those are the infographics. They're related to domestic terrorism, which is why they're in that category. And again, they're available for you um, after this event. I mean, after this uh, talk. So now uh, these are we're going to we're going to swerve now to foreign uh, terrorist organizations. And here's the list, the current list of for, um, designated foreign terrorist organizations. And those are the ones that um, our American citizens have been affiliated with. And so those are the ones that are going to be on the charts. And this is the first one. And I want you to notice how ISIS is number one with 208, Al Qaeda number two with 109. Even though Al Qaeda has been around since, you know, essentially 9 11, so uh, 20 years, and ISIS just came about in 2014 and 15, yet it has skyrocketed. And part of that has to do with social media. And they really recruit hard and they have, they spend a lot of money, like Hollywood money on their videos and their, and their journals and magazines to recruit. I bet you guys did not know that we actually have an internet, uh, international terrorist cell near Red House, Virginia. So this comes from Google Maps. And if you see this top one, there's Red House, and you see right to the right of the Red House, that little logo there. And I zoomed in, and you can see, and the reason I zoomed in is because the group is called Al-Fukra, Shema Al-Fukra, and their founder is Mubarak al -Aghani. And you can see here, if you, if, uh, you know, I don't know what size your screens are, but you can see that the name Sheikh Al-Ghalani is the name of that street there. And I actually, in my last talk, I gave in Chicago Live, there were members, um, people that investigated this and said, oh, yes, everybody knows around there that this terrorist cell exists. And one of them said that he delivered like UPS and there's this guard gate, gate guard and you cannot actually go into this compound, which you see on the lower um, left hand side, that image also from Google Maps. Uh, there's there's a gatehouse and you're not allowed to go in there beyond that. And if you look to the uh, down the road and up the road, you can see some other areas that are also part of this same compound. Now, this guy here, Anwar al alaki he, he was um, he was he was he's, he was killed in a drone strike. The U.S. Uh, killed him in 2011. He was the first one that the country went to after 9/11 and wanted to talk to him and you know, get that that. Um, is that Muslim perspective. And so they reached out to him. And then obviously he, he went a little, um, you know, off his rocker and decided to support terrorism and, and did so in a way where even though he's dead, he's still recruiting people. And by the way, because he was, he, he, I found him to be so egregious. I wanted to make sure you saw that, that picture, uh, that, that announcement of him being arrested for uh, soliciting prostitutes, because I want you to see what a good Muslim he was. 50% uh, of the Americans um, convicted of acts of terrorism were in possession of CDs, email correspondence, or had um, his YouTube videos in their internet history. Obviously, uh, this was all the correspondence was done prior to 2011, or this would be a very different presentation. And now we're going back to <laughs> cells and partners and uh, lone wolf. And because one of the questions is, are they working? Are these groups aligned with the international terrorist group? Are they aligned with the domestic group? Or are they acting alone? So we just talked about the international groups, the domestic groups. And what we find out is that 62% um, did not have any correspondence with leadership from any, any other group, even if they identified and said, I belong to ISIS, 
I, I support ISIS. Um, if they did not have any actual communication, they were acting as a lone wolf. Many of them worked as partners, 19%, and 19% worked as cells. So those cells, though, some of the cells are so large, they influence those numbers that we saw previously. This is one, again, I did not have this initially, but I was asked to provide it. And so what I'm just showing here is the number that uh, were not Muslim, raised Muslim, and converted to Islam. Now we're going to go, this is my favorite category, college education. Now, of all of them, I don't know, it's a lot of information. Again, you can come back to it later. Um, and the, the sample size here is, is pretty significant. Of, the, of all of them, 172 had some college or, or completed and have a degree. 89 had some high school or completed and have a high school diploma. When it comes down to filtering that, we have for uh, allegiance, we have international 150, no affiliation 12, domestic four. Now STEM fields, and I'm in a STEM field, so you know this is important um, to me and, and to others, of course. Uh, of all of them that had college education, 57% were in STEM fields, 43% were not. And you can see at the bottom right, birth of uh, college versus high school, naturalized um, college versus high school. These are uh, in, on the, on, in the slide in front of you, those are the degrees in which the terrorists sought. And the ones in the reddish color, those are the STEM fields. So I think the important thing to look at, well, first, if, if you're in this field and you hit some of those eight markers, just give yourself another shout out in the chat so that I can keep track of you. Normally, if we were doing this as a, as a live audience, I, I might be able to call you out by name. If you're in the front row sleeping, I'd definitely call you out. But um, for now, I just have to assume that you're, you're paying attention and you're thinking and you might know people that fit. Now you're seeing these, these uh, fields. And also what kind of damage these people could have done if in their fields, they were able to carry out the terrorist acts that they sought. These are the occupations and these are just the top op occupations. And again, I think about it, healthcare, you know, if they were in healthcare and terrorist activity, transportation, food service, IT, what damage they could have done if they were able to, to make that happen. These are the occupations. There's quite a few of them. Some of them are kind of funny. String of jobs, for example, taxi driver, not really funny. There's the Walmart guy or girl, uh, UPS. And that was it. So now we're moving on to the social classes. And I said I was going to bring this up because I said that if you were uh, poor, uh, if you grew up in a poor family, sit down. Now, working class, because you look at this and you think, well, working class means poor. But you guys are from the Cleveland area. I'm sure you had a lot of business and industry. And you know, the, there's a lot of people working class that make more money than me. So working class does not really mean that you're poor. Now, unemployed, however, does mean poor. And as you can see, 23 of those were unemployed on the male side. And, uh, and that doesn't take away from some of the working class are indeed making minimum wage or less. And so that could mean that they are poor. So I don't want you to think this disagrees with the, the stats that other researchers have found. It just really kind of hones in and gives you more information. These, uh, the, the 58 people listed here are the military terrorists. And uh, as an as a army uh, veteran, the military terrorists were indeed important to me. So I'm calling them out by name. And information and how they relate or do not relate to the, uh, to the main body of terrorists. And you can see here, uh, mental health, you have more claiming mental health issues. Now that could be just because they've experienced I mean, 20 years of war. It could also mean that, that they are more um, observed, um, clinically observed than the, than the normal average citizen. So they're getting tagged early. You can see the marital status is higher than the main public and the ethnicity, also very similar. And then just give you an example of the citizenship surrounding the veterans. Um, some of them were actually in, in the service, so not veterans. 
um, birth being the highest citizenship, but that would be ex expected um, in the military. Weapons used by the military terrorists, because the terrorists were are trained to use weapons, I thought that would be interesting to see what kind of weapons they use. They definitely like their firearms. Uh, I, I list here, just as a side note, how many of them converted to, to Islam. And you can see that number has also increased 59%. And then targets. So these are just the targets from the military. And you can see the military, uh, military bases and the Navy. And I don't know about the three siblings in Bolingbrook, Illinois, but that was a target by one of them. Um, the variety, now this is done by uh, alphabetical. So Antifa members is just on top because it starts with an A. Uh, it's, it's not because they more military terrorists uh, targeted them. So this just gives you a better comparison, military versus all, mental health, married, divorce, domestic, international, and then of course birth. So then by the numbers, uh, they range from service from 42, 1942 to 2019, 45% of them committed their crime within zero and five years exiting the service. 88 were enlisted despite of a future violent outcome. 30% were uh, received an honorable discharge and 59% of them converted to Islam. And then the branches. I had to separate the army so we didn't look so bad, but 24 army, 10 National Guard, 10 Marines, seven Navy, two Ar Army Reserves, one Air Force, one Marine Reserve. Now I, I have, to, yeah, I'm right next door to Wright Pad. It is literally down the block from here. And I spent two and a half years over there um, helping strategic planning. And, you know, I think the biggest reason why the Air Force has such a small number is because their military, uh, their, their airmen are trained differently than the army. Uh, they have a, a job that, that transfers to the civilian world, world more so than the army. Uh, for example, here on this next slide, I list some of the of the MOSs of the army, uh, or excuse me, of the terrorists. And one of them is Patriot Missile. When I was in, I was in Hawk Missile. And it doesn't transfer very well into the civilian world. And you know, they give you really nice sign-on bonuses when you go into the military and you're in these kinds of jobs because it doesn't transfer. And I have to admit that sign-on bonus was nice, but when I went into the recruiter. I said I wanted to learn to be tough, and you know they showed me this this beautiful sunny day, and you know working with the missiles. What they did not show me was Germany in the winter, in the cold, trying to do that same job. But you know I did it, and uh, no regrets, no regrets at all. Now some other things that that could make this uh, make us understand why they can transition to become terrorists. Having been stationed in Germany, and you go into a pub in Germany, and they play a you know, born in the USA or something like that. I mean, the, the military people in that, in that bar, in that club take over because we are so patriotic. I mean, obviously we enlist knowing that we're potentially putting our lives at stake for, for our country. So it's just difficult to understand sometimes, but look at it like this. Like I mentioned the sign-on bonus and the next one, military take care of the people. You know, I'm not saying it happened to me, but maybe once or twice you get paid, you get that, what, that paycheck on the first of the month. And then you buy that stereo system or whatever it is. And by the, by the end of the week, you're broke. But you still have a job. You still have a place to live. You still have food. And so you don't really have to learn how to man manage your money until you get out of the service. And that transition is difficult. I, um, when I got out, I was the wife then of a military officer, a military person. And I found it very difficult to transition and to hang out with the military wives. I so much more wanted to interact with my people, which were the military um, not and not the military uh, wives. The transition, again, is difficult because you know, when you're in, you have that sense of brotherhood. And I imagine I have quite a few veterans out here that are nodding their head and agreeing with what I'm saying. You have that sense of brotherhood, that sense of camaraderie and community, and you don't have that anymore. Also, in my case, I ETS in the military, I mean, overseas. And when I ets um, I, I ets my husband immediately got sent up and came back home. I was, I was near eight months pregnant in the middle of the country, out of the service, and my unit did not care. And I was angry. And, you know, granted, I still love my country and I still do what I can to help keep this resilience in our country. But I can see how being put in that situation and for three weeks living in a foreign country 
way us out. Anybody caring, uh, you know, if you ever made it home or not is rough. And, and then going on to the next one, your experience with PTSD and other mental illnesses. Um, again, I mentioned that they may be checked more frequently or maybe they just really are, you know, have those problems. And then marriage incentives. Uh, my husband and I got married a year after we, we met, which in the military is a really long time. Most people get married right away because you get that extra pay. And that extra pay may, may mean less commitment, which is why the marriage and the military versus the rest of the terrorists could be increased. And I'm gonna take a breath and move on. Uh, our study was the 58 um, military people. The FBI did one, so I looked at terrorists. Uh, FBI did one with active shooters. And you can see that, that they are, the numbers are pretty similar with one difference is that there were no uh, Coast Guard terrorists. Okay, so now we're going to move on to behind bars. With the first one being a timeline. Now when we do timelines like this so we can forecast what, what our future is going to look like. And you know, one way, one thing you want to do when you look is you notice those, those um, spikes and you want to look at them and go, well, what was going on in our country at that time? So that you can maybe make those spikes not happen in the future. And so in 2003, we see a spike. And what happened then? Uh, you know, usually I'd like to ask the audience to give me some of their thoughts on it. But, but because I'm the only one speaking right now, I'm going to say my thoughts are these are copycats from 2000, from the 9-11. Uh, you can see from eight to nine, huge spike. And I'd like to think, I mean, you know, we were going through a recession at that time. We also I had a presidency. And so there are some things going on there that could have made people turn to terrorism. In 2015, doesn't it look like, like the 2015 giving us the middle finger? Uh, now, I think that what this is ISIS. This is 2014, 15, 16. This is when ISIS was really getting, getting uh, well known and, and doing a lot of heavy recruiting. And, and now you see here with 2020, 2021, the numbers are pretty low. And that could be COVID, that could be uh, other extremist activities going on. Um, we don't know, we're just gonna have to wait. Invite me back in five years and I can give you the rest of the stats and see how that, how that plays out. I mentioned material support was the, uh, the most common charge of all of them, 320 had material support. Now it doesn't mean that they were only uh, charged, convicted of just material support. There was, you know, some of them were their material support and firearms and money laundering. And uh, but in order to give you a good uh, understanding uh, based off of that, those original slides to see um, just how um, the different the different charges that they've been convicted of, to have you look at those and see and see those as acts related to terrorism. And this is a better, uh, a better graphic um, understanding of it. Again, 320 for material support. You look up at the top, it's hidden from me because of the, the screens, um, the information, but 11 terrorists. Now terrorism is only, it's a, it's a state um, charge. It's not a federal charge, 11 people. So of the terrorists that we, I was, we, I, were able to find out um, had, had done anything related to to uh, terrorism, of all of them, only 11 of them had actual terrorist charges. So when I say acts related to terrorism, uh, there is a reason for that, as opposed to just calling them right out terrorist. So I wanted to look at violence and nonviolence because I think long-term it'd be really nice to have some kind of a, a program for terrorists to, instead of having them go to jail, the ones that don't use a weapon that are nonviolent, to maybe go through some sort of a program where you know they're you know where we can find out if they they were encouraged and brainwashed and then that that um, the terrorist thing goes off. I I kind of liken this to the um, to kind of like the born again, and you get somebody that quits smoking cigarettes or you get somebody that that quits drinking alcohol or somebody that finds religion. And they just go, you know, like you don't even want to be around those people because if they smell a cigarette, you know, a, a football field away, they're going to cough and they're going to kind of over the top, right? Or somebody that that finds um, finds religion um, all of a sudden now wants to like 
recruit everybody to also find religion. And so you find these people that just immediately kind of, you know, go, go a little over the top. But then as time goes by, that tapers off and decreases. And so what I'd like to think is that for many of these, had, had we been able to wait and, and see how that would taper off, I do think it would taper and maybe decrease. But you have to get them you know, immediately because you don't know if they're hopping on a plane or planning to hop on a plane, you don't know if they're gonna be the, the ones you know, starting another 9-11. But you know, this one, in this case, nonviolent 71%, that's a high number. And I did want to throw in the, the, terror, the military terrorists just to give you that comparison. You can see it's very similar. Um, this is FBI involvement. And, you know, we've heard about 9-11 and there's been a couple other events that you hear about. But for the most part, all of these activities are happening under the radar. And it's thanks to, thanks to the FBI and organizations like that that keeps us from finding out what is happening. This is um, ethnicity. This is on the top, gender on the bottom, and this relates to sentencing. And I, I don't think you guys are going to be surprised by finding uh, this, by seeing this information. When it comes to sentencing, uh, African American versus Caucasian, if you look um, on this chart, you can see early on, no African American was charged with the sentence under a year. And then as that tapers up in sentence lengths, the uh, African American sentences, uh, the numbers are higher than their um, Caucasian counterparts. And below, you see females versus males. So, what's interesting to know is I mentioned that I did the stats in 16 and I did the stats in 2018. And these numbers are actually starting to um, merge a little bit more. Uh, there was quite a difference because, again, they thought females that we were doing activities out of love, uh, that we were doing the activities. Um, because we were brainwashed and not because we were actually evil creatures. And I think the courts are now understanding that, that females are not innocent. And, and those gaps in sentencing for, for genders, those go across all different crimes. It's not just terrorism. But again, you know, in this case, it's a great time to point out that the best stats are the ones that meet your assumptions. So you may have thought, oh, well, everybody knows it's gonna be this age range or this sentence length, but but to be able to say, I know this because I saw these stats really helps uh, solidify. And you know, we talk about making decisions without bias and this allows you to give that information without the bias of you already knowing. This, uh, this slide talks about terrorist training. I brought that up with material support. And I just wanna show you some of the places that our people are going to do this training. Now, I did not, think, um, I did not know exactly where to put this because they are going off in training and is this religious because they're going overseas and are aligned with, with a terrorist organization and they typically be, you know, a, a bastardized form of Islam or, um, or is it, you know, a crime and should I put it in the criminal section? And I decided that yes, because we do know that this is a huge, you know, material support that this huge with crime, I've, I've um, put it in this area. And as you can see, 28% att um, attended a terrorist, terrorist um, training camp. And that does not include all of them that attempted to attend a training camp. And right now you can see that the majority of them have um, done this in Syria. And in fact, of the five women that attended training, all of them were in Syria. And I know I gave you the targets for the military, but these are the targets for all of the others. And while I was doing this research, bridges, it was like every other person was trying to blow up a bridge. And so I actually went back to look at the stats on this because I wanted to know why the bridges were so um, prominent and, and were they in fact that prominent or was it just something that just kept hitting my radar? And it ended up that there were quite a few, but definitely not the top one. Also, you probably look down this list and, and you see church and you see one, that's because the others were not um, arrested as terrorists. They were active shooters and extremists. So that's why you only see one church. Uh, and then you can see some of the other targets. So a wise person may think, okay, I'm just gonna avoid all those places and then I'll be safe. But can you avoid, okay, certainly you can avoid being military. Can you avoid being in a public place? Not likely. Can you avoid military installations? Yes, unless you live, um, work um, less than a mile from one. So if you go through this and it's like, yeah, you're really not going to be able to avoid um, being in a situation where you could be a target. 
this is on weapons use. And again, um, I want to show you military simply because uh, military and weapons just remind you what those stats were. And you can see the majority, uh, the big chart, that's all of them. 120 of the uh, terrorists did not use any weapons and their favorite were, were explosives. And with the military, uh, you can see the majority were none, but the favorite was by far the firearms. These are the prison locations of the terrorists. Now, I thought that, you know, I would find something really exciting about this data. And, and you know, really it's not because we're talking about 20 years, much like why I can't tell you about social media because social media has only been around a short time. And can I say where most of the terrorists are residing, uh, you know, in prison so we can avoid those places? Because prisons, if you have like, like, um, you know, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's in a prison and you want to be a terrorist, so you're going to move to wherever he is in that prison and commit, um, you know, a terrorist act. And so that prison area becomes a kind of a mecca for terrorist wannabes. No, because they come in and they, they're released and they come in. And so it's really not uh, something that is valuable other than you can see where they are um, and, and know that you have terrorists either you know, in your state, residing in your state in a prison or not. And this really relates a lot to the previous one with residents. I'm thinking I need to move out to Montana. And that's it. Uh, again, I just want you to see the learning objectives. And I hope that if you skim through these learning objectives, you're thinking, yeah, in this hour, I did learn all these things and you feel like it was valuable. But I do want you to know um, this is done and I'm gonna open it up to questions, but I don't want you to feel like I left out Ohio people. So you can see here, these are all the Ohio terrorists and I actually go into more detail on each of them. Uh, if we had more time, I would talk to you about all those, but because we don't have that time, I'm just gonna show you this and let you know that you can, of course, go to that um, PDF and download it and learn more about Ohio terrorists and how to compare with the rest of the world. And with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and allow you to ask questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Arazi. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I thought it might be most efficient to uh, have people pose questions in the chat and I can read them out loud so the group okay. can hear them if they're not following along. Um, and so if you have a question, please uh, go ahead and, and put it there. And I can, I know there's a few that uh, sprung up during your presentation. So I'll just read those while others might be uh, forming their questions. But um, uh, one question was, uh, uh, as I'm aware, none of the January 6th rioters have been charged with terrorism. What is the burden of proof for designating a, an activity as terrorism? Um, well, the burden of proof is, like I mentioned, uh, those it has to fit that definition, and they have to be. It has to be something that they're charged and can be, you know, prosecuted on. So you can charge them with ten different things, but they may or may not be prosecuted. So this this only included those that have been put forth with charges, and again, that relates to fitting exactly extremists versus terrorists. Okay, I see that new question. Um, so so that's, um, that's the big difference is, it fits. So the two questions fit, so let's go on. So let's do that. Extremists, terrorists are extremists, but not all extremists are terrorists. Does that help? So an active shooter is like the one I mentioned with the Oregon district in, in, my, uh, in Dayton. He had no aspirations to, to convince people to change the way they live. He just had this, this desire to kill a bunch of people and become famous. He was not a terrorist. He was an extremist and some extremists you know, are terrorists, but the difference is they have to fit that ideology, political, try, trying to change the way we live for those reasons, political, ideological, religious. So that might actually uh, address or be relevant to a few questions above that one that was uh, posed earlier. Uh, were the Route 82 bombers included in that list? And you, sh you showed a list of uh, terrorists uh, by state. Uh, that would have been five right there for one incident. Um, so is that sort of uh, speaking to what you were just uh, responding to for that other question then? Yes, yes. Uh, again, it's, yeah, I, I could share my, my uh, spreadsheet because it would li it list everybody, you know, with more details on each of them. And 
but that would just overwhelm you with the data. And because it's not complete, you know, there's gaps. So if anybody wants to help me with this research and fill in those gaps, you know, volunteer. But uh, yeah, so again, the big difference, the big takeaway is a terrorist act has to align with that definition of terrorism. And uh, also they can get charged, but not necessarily convicted, prosecuted. So you have to keep that in mind. You don't wanna throw 10 charges at them if you don't think any of them are gonna stick you may go for a lesser charge that you know will work. I'm not a lawyer, so I can't get into too much. <laughs> Understood. Uh, another question that I see here is, why is the gang in Haiti who kidnapped 17 Ohioans not considered a terrorist group? Um, what gang that kidnapped? Um, well, again, they're, they're the reason for, I don't know about this incident, but the reason would be they did not fit into that. So if they kidnapped those people, did they kidnap them because they wanted to scare everybody else and make them, you know, change the way they vote? Did they do it because they wanted to change uh, because they did not like the ethnicity of the people? I mean, what were the reasoning behind it? And that would define if it was a terrorist act or not and why they would make it on my list. Um, a great example would be, the San Bernardino people, when that was happening, I remember I had to go to work, but I knew it was going on. And they're like, it took a long time for them to de designate that as a terrorist activity. And, but I remember I, my mom was calling me is like telling me, okay, it's a terrorist act or not, you know? So it is, it's once it hits, gets off my terrorist radar, I quit paying attention and I focus on other things. I personally think that, the, okay, I see Haitians are in the, um, yeah, see, I don't know about that event and I'm sorry. Um, you know, the another thing like the Pulse nightclub is considered a terrorist event. I personally don't think it was a terrorist event, but everybody else calls it that. So I do. I think the guy was uncomfortable with his sexuality. And so he wanted to prove that he was not a homosexual. So he shot up, you know, killed a bunch of people. Um, but it's considered a terrorist act. So, you know, I'm going to go with the majority, uh, you know, the ones that actually uh, arrest. Well, in this case, not arrest, but the ones that actually make the rules. If, if the definition of terms includes threats or actual violence to influence change in policy, yes. That would be change of government, change in politics. Sorry, some of the questions are popping up as it goes through. So yeah, they're see. coming in, they're coming in fast now. And they're coming in in two different areas. There's a Q&A uh, table as well as a chat table. So. Um, Getting back to the Haiti question, you know, there's a ransom associated with that event, um, which is probably what you're sort of uh, hitting at. With, with they're motivated, as someone mentioned in, in the chat, by it's a monetary, um, yeah. not necessarily a belief system. Um, another question in the Q and A is uh, considering. I don't think you've answered this. Yeah, considering the distinction between terrorists and violent extremists, have charges like racketeering been considered for groups like Antifa and Black Lives Matter that wouldn't fit the paradigm for terrorist groups? Uh, you know, so one of the most common questions I get asked is about Antifa and Black Lives Matter as being leaderless organizations and, and get uh, categorized into the terrorist, um, you know, the groups. And again, we have to, in my opinion, they're kind of like pseudo terrorists that there are members that are committing crimes and there are members that are not committing crimes. And I think in both cases, you have to look at them more as individual and I consider them more pseudo terrorist organizations. Um, but, you know, we have to leave it. I'm not the one that's going to say that's a terrorist organization and that one is not. I leave it up to the State Department to tell me. Looks like I skipped one earlier, too. Um, why do you believe IEDs and bombs are pre a preferred method to terrorize? And is this particularly common among U.S. domestic terrorists? I think it's because those are easy to create. You can buy everything you would need to do that and, uh, you know, going shopping as opposed to, you know, like, you know, bio warfare, chem warfare, but you know what else? Also hopping in your vehicle and, and slamming into a crowd, also really, really popular recently. I, uh, I had a, I'm not trying to name drop, <laughs> but I had a sit down with uh, Director Ray back in 2018 or 19. And I asked him specifically, because the big thing was for terrorists, it's cheaper for them to just get in their car and 
and plow down a crowd, uh, did he really think that chem warfare or bio warfare was going to be a, an issue long term? Um, you know, it's just easier to be that lone wolf than to spend all that money to do some do a, a chem uh, chem weapon or a bio weapon. And he said he did think they would continue, but there would be small pockets of those things happening versus um, large scale like we've seen in the past. Okay, thank you. I, I think I caught up on all the questions. Is, is there anybody else that has a question that they're um, forming right now? Please uh, drop it in there. We'll give you a couple seconds here. And they can also email me if they want. Um, if you want to, if they want to reach out to you or, or you want to give them my email address, that's absolutely fine. So, and on that topic too, as, as we were, uh, you know, as I was kind of thinking through uh, what you had provided and what you're referencing in your presentation, would you have any um, uh, concern with us posting, like, so in addition to posting this recording on our website, posting the materials you sent to me in advance uh, along with that on the website, or would you like me to send those out directly, or is it? Uh, Either way, we're, we're happy to. to Either work. way, I didn't give okay. you anything, uh, anything that I would be worried about being, you know, sharing publicly. Okay, great. Thank it's you. also why I use open source to get my information because I want to be able to share this. You know, the goal is to, to um, decrease recruiting and sharing classified information to only classified people would not be the way to get the message out. Uh, you know, sure. it's so everything's open source. Okay, great. Uh, it looks like we've hit a wall with the questions. So, um, so yeah, if you think it's some, if, if anyone else has a question for uh, Dr. Arazi uh, down the road, we'll share her contact information. And again, we'll post the uh, materials on the website as well. Um, at this point, uh, you know, I just again want to reiterate how uh, grateful we are that you took time to, to provide this presentation. Uh, You'll have to take my word for it, but we have this very nice plaque for you that you can't see because it's glass, but uh, it's just the token of our appreciation for you, uh, again, um, taking a, a few moments to uh, share this, you know, this interesting subject matter with us and hopefully uh, help us better prepare and uh, mitigate, you know, uh, issues that pertain to it. So, again, we really do appreciate your time, and, um, and I think I speak for all, everybody on this, in this Zoom that uh, it was pretty fascinating and enlightening. Great. Wonderful. Um, thank you. Right. And, I, and, you know, uh, that's good. Yeah, right. I have a place for it over here. <laughs> I imagine you do. You sound like you have a, a lot of accomplishments on your belt. So, so yeah, this is just one more to your notch, right? Um, so, uh, with that, uh, did, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, so, with that, uh, we'll go ahead and close this out. Again, everybody that's on this call, please, uh, if you haven't done so already and you're interested in some of the other, or the two other presentations that are still uh, scheduled to occur this year, um, please feel free to register for those. Dr. Arazi, I'll, I'll share those with you as well if you're interested in, in particular in the crisis communication one. Um, and then again, uh, everybody, please be mindful that the uh, December date uh, will change uh, to another uh, time in December. Uh, and we'll definitely send messaging out to make sure everybody's aware of that. With that, thank you all again for your time. And Dr. Arazi, thank you again for yours. Take care, My everybody. My pleasure. Bye-bye.